Good morning. Uh, before we begin, let's uh, let's have a word of prayer for Mark and for his son Stanton. Uh, thank you, Father, for again another opportunity to be in your presence. Uh, we're so very grateful uh, for this, the eternal Word of God. You are the Lord of the Word. And we are uh, mindful of our leader and our friend and our counselor, and our teacher, instructor. And now, uh, through this very difficult trial, uh, our example of faith and fortitude, would you be with Mark and his family today? Would this be the day that we have uh, a stirring turnaround for Stanton? And again, Lord, uh, what a great privilege we have to intercede on Mark's behalf um, because he has given so much of himself to not only this class, but to Believer's Chapel and outside of Believer's Chapel to so many uh, friends uh, in the Christian community, in the Christian world. So we count it a privilege to pray and we look to you, uh, Lord, as the psalmist said, morning by morning I set my petitions before you, and morning by morning I wait in expectation. So, again, in expectation we wait for you and for your goodness and your mercy to be shown, um, not only for Mark and Cindy, but for Stanton, and bring him back to us in accordance with your will. And we'll give you thanks and praise for that in Jesus' name. Amen. We are beginning in Proverbs chapter 28. This morning, this section of the Proverbs really goes from 28.1 to 29.27. I have picked out uh, the first 11 verses, but we're going to skip uh, a few of those verses because we've either covered the topic or they are uh, not nearly as difficult as the ones we have chosen. So, uh, beginning in 28.1, this is really a, a comical uh, proverb if you believe in comedy in the book of Proverbs. Here it is, 28.1. The wicked flee, though no one is pursuing. But the righteous are as bold as a lion. Uh, 28.2, uh, you may have for or when. I have, uh, I'm following Bruce Walkie's translation here. He, he makes it two purpose clauses. So he uses the word because twice, because of the transgression of a land, its princes are many, and then the second because, but because of a discerning understanding, it's one word, we'll talk about that, uh, because of a person who is discerning and understanding one who knows what is right endures. Now, that's a very difficult translation. Uh, we alliterate it uh, in English with much more precision, but I'm going to try to just stick to the words and let the words of the inspired language uh, fill in the blanks, if you will, in the text. Uh, so we're going to skip three and four and go to five. Here is evil people do not, it's uh, again the same uh, conundrum. Is it discern? Is it understand? It's one word. And the unfortunately, with all the various translations that we have, 
it can confuse you. Is discern the same as understanding? Yes. It's one and the same. And so here it is in 28.5. What is right or it's actually the word justice in the Proverbs and in the Psalms. A very famous Old Testament word. But the one who seeks the Lord discerns everything. Look how open-ended that is. That's a real interpretive question that we want to address. Six and seven, we're going to skip and go to eight. The one who increases his wealth by interest or surcharges of any sort. Now, you may have a profit or gain there. It's really... A it's two words combined, meaning profit or gain. Uh, we translate it of any sort to accommodate words from the poor. So it's actually taking advantage of the poor. And then here's an important word, gathers. Uh, that is a word study that we need. Gathers it for one who is gracious to the poor. Nine. As for the one who turns his ear aside, and that important word there is to turn. What is that word? How is it used? I'm going to give you a word picture for it. Turns his ear aside from uh, hearing instruction. Even his prayers are detestable. You may have abomination. Uh, verse 10, as for the one who misleads the upright in an evil way, he will fall into his own pit. But the blameless, uh, that is Paul's idea, by the way, in Ephesians. Remember, he chose you before the foundation of the world. And here's the purpose for him choosing you before the foundation of the world, that you would be holy, in other words, separated from the world, more like him, and blameless. That's the Old Testament idea. What is blameless? We've covered it. We'll review it again. Blameless will inherit good things. And then finally, verse 11, uh, a rich person he is wise in his own eyes, but the discerning poor searches him out. And the key there is what is to search. I think you'll find it as fascinating as I did. Now, uh, here we begin in 28.1, the fleeing wicked. It is one of the presuppositions of theology that we as we approach the Bible, that there are only two kinds of men in the world. There is the regenerate and the unregenerate, those who have been born of the Spirit and those who are dead in their trespasses and sins. This has uh, alluded in the New Testament to figures, light and darkness, sheep and goats, and so what does the proverb add to that? Well, it adds this proverb. Uh, weakness versus strength. Uh, supernatural strength, to be sure. So two kinds of men could not be made more evident. It is the righteous versus the wicked. Verse 1, behind the mask of the unregenerate, the the appearance uh, here, wisdom exposes his inner core. Here's really what's going on down deep with him. And it is paranoia. The wicked are afraid, and thus they flee. Uh, John Calvin in his Institutes pointed out that although Caligula was considered to be the most powerful man in all the world, he was in fact afraid of the dark and would hide underneath his bed at the sound of thunder. The wicked are afraid and they therefore express their fear 
in the psychology of unbelief, which is a mind filled with superstitions, invisible predators, if you will, luck and chance. I've seen it. I've seen it in the boardroom. Uh, men panic over the smallest of things. Um, oil men with big fat fingers and bushy mustaches and big thick belts, belt buckles. Uh, they're filled with all kinds of superstitions and, uh, and, and convictions about it. It's, it was crazy. I saw it. Uh, this top line, to flee, uh, to remove oneself from a region or an area of danger. And though, or you might have when explaining a providence or a circumstance. And here it is. No one is pursuing. See that? The same verb of Proverbs 21.21, of pursuing righteousness. So, flight without pursuit. Now, that is the wickedness or the result of wickedness of the children of Israel. Leviticus 26, 17. Those who hate you, said the Lord, are going to rule over you. And you will flee when no one pursues. So it is a telltale sign of your lack of faith because of unbelief. Consequences that come to you as the result of sin in your life. Now look at this hard contrast. Line two, but here's the confidence of a believer. The boldness of the righteous is likened to the image of a lion. And why shouldn't it be that way? Proverbs 3, 5, we trust the Lord with all of our hearts we lean not unto our own understanding, but in all our ways, we trust Him. And we believe in Him. And we acknowledge Him. And that creates within the believer an inward security. And as a result, they, the believer, at the Important moments and important times. He stands boldly. Remember, the Lord told the disciples, don't worry about when you stand before the magistrates and the judges and the people of power. Don't worry about what you're going to say. I'm going to give you those words. And I'm going to give you the boldness and the strength to exhibit yourself that way. That's what this... Proverb is talking about bold as the lion, the king of the beasts, aggressing, and has the ability to maul its attackers. Now, there's a natural theological tension here. Because as I read the New Testament, I'm told over and over how weak I am. I am a, a man of weakness. So, how do I explain this boldness? How do I understand the proverb? Well, I understand it this way. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 9. Power made perfect in weakness. There it is. It's His power, not mine. And it's working in me, in you, for the appropriate occasion. It's His power alone, not yours, not your constitution. What do we as believers do? We put no confidence in the flesh whatsoever. And so, we see the martyrs. And what's their consistent testimony? They submitted. They didn't panic. They perished. But they were... Powerful testimonies. Bold as lions. He will provide that. 
for you and for me at the appropriate occasion for our lives. I finished reading last year. Uh, Gavin Ye's uh, History of the Reformation. I was very intrigued to follow the Reformation as it came to us out of Switzerland because there was one particular fellow I wanted to hone in on. Flaming red hair. Red beard. William Farrell. William Farrell, a converted Catholic, a man of great power and moved a nation. Quite a testimony. His claim to fame is he took one weak, little, timid scholar by the name of John Calvin and convinced him that he needed to stay in Geneva. And here he would launch the Reformation out of Europe. That was the man behind the curtain, and his name was William Farrell. Here's what Dabney referenced about Farrell. Many hard trials, particularly early, but he never gave in to discouragement, he writes. And then he says this, Farrell, the greater the difficulties, the more his energy increased. When I started preparing for this lesson, I asked that the Lord would apply that specifically to our friend Mark as he was up and down with Stanton over all of his medical conditions. The greater the difficulty, the greater the foes, the more his energy increased. That is strength and power in the midst of our weakness. It is power made perfect. Here is verse 2. Because and because. Because of the transgressions of a land and because of a discerning purpose. We open the top line with the word transgression. Literally, when a land rebels, land is a figure for the citizenry of a people that is ruled over. So it is people that are under some form of discipline from the Lord. And here's the discipline. Princes, officials who are invested with power. And here is the judgment of God upon the people. Those princes are many. You see that? Advisors, officials. It's the bureaucracy. Hey, it's big government. And it's wonderful. Can't you just feel it working for you every day? Yeah. And it's not just this political party against that one. No, no, we've got far more sophisticated than that. We now have Senator Wingwell, who comes out of what state? Who knows? But he's got his band of eight, or band of 12, or band of 18, and now they control everything. He's the circuit breaker. You want to get something done? You go see Senator Wingwell. It's craziness. It is God's judgment upon our land. We can't get anything done. Everybody's running everything through their little fiefdom. And so, that is God's wickedness upon a land. Line two, but here we have the light in the midst of the darkness, a discerning person. Now that word discerning, or you may have understanding, as I said, they're one in the same, same word, to grasp something intelligently. Here it is, Genesis 41, 39. The Pharaoh praises Joseph after he explained the Pharaoh's dreams. And here's what he says. 
Who has more discernment? Who has more understanding, he says, than this man, he asks his court. What do you think they're going to say? Uh, and what does Joseph do? He extends counsel to them. That's what he does. That's discernment. We're going to see it in just a moment. Again, associated with Joseph. Here's something that I find as a golden treasure in this proverb. You see these two words, who knows? We would normally think we've understood those and we skip over them. But really, the two words in this particular stem, who knows, is actually the rendering of a king's verdict in the Old Testament. Uh, 1 Kings 3.28 is where it's used. But here's the most famous usage of the two words. Who knows? It's Esther 4.14. It's Mordecai's appeal to Esther that she put her personal life at risk and appear before the king, although he's not summoned her. Esther 4.14. And he says... Here's your words. Who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for a time such as this. Now let's just put the two Proverbs together. One and two. What is Mordecai saying to Esther? Here's what he's saying. Be bold. Go be bold. And appear before the king. And the outcome will be his judgment, whether he extends the scepter to you or not. And, you, and what does she respond? If I perish, I perish. She's going to go by faith and trust the Lord in that very moment. It's the king's judgment. He can have you slain or he can bring you into his court. That's who knows. Very powerful little term there that's hidden in the proverb. So, here is our final word of the proverb. Endures. What does that mean? Endures. Well, in the Semitic mind, it means length. It's used in Genesis chapter 6 for the ark. The ark was long. That's what endures. It keeps going and going and going. Now, what is the proverb saying? Many bureaucrats here, they're blights on the land. They have no skill. They are not teaching us anything. They're, they're up there for themselves. They have no understanding. All in contrast to the wise. Now what do the wise do? Well, here they are. Here's your bureaucrat for you that's wise. His name was Joseph. And what did he tell the Pharaoh to do? He told him, now you need to select a man to administer for the next 14 years, this abundance and this blight. That's what you should do. You should put a plan in place. And then, what was his counsel proven? Well, over 14 years, it was long. It endured. It proved to be right. Here's another one for you. How about 1 Samuel 30? David wins this gigantic victory against the Amalekites. Has all of the abundance of their goods. And he comes back and he's greeted by the men too exhausted to go down into the battle. And so, a debate breaks out. Should they receive the same as the men who fought the battle? Spur of the moment, David gives a rendering, a judgment. 
And what does the, what does the historian tell us? In 1 Samuel 30, that that rule of David became law. It became a rule to that day that he penned it. All in Israel. That's wisdom. Spur of the moment. Decisions that are righteous and make a difference with people. So, here's five. Evil people do not understand, discern. There's our word again. What is, here's either right or justice, but the one who seeks the Lord discerns everything. Now, when we're studying Proverbs, what we want to do is we want to look at repetitions because that, that's little signposts that are blaring at us so that helps us in our understanding. But here's what captivates our attention when we look at a proverb and we see that word L-O-R-D. That shuts everything down. That is the voice of the burning bush. Okay? What do we know about that voice? Wisdom and skill comes from Him. All right, how did that practically work out? Well, here's how it worked out. He told Moses what to do and when to do it. Moses followed that word and he was enormously successful. That's what we want to know right now because we're seeking counsel, guidance. So we open the proverb with the morally repulsive, evil people. They have no understanding. Uh, I thought about that. You know what really deludes men is everything is measured by them. Um, they create their own standard. I got to thinking about this this week. I was listening to two men talk about the the camp that they're running for the NFL players, the combine. And they're doing all these tests for them. And uh, one commentator said, you know, the fastest 40 time that's ever been clocked in the combine is 4.2 seconds. Now, 4.2 seconds in a 40-yard dash, that's liquid vapor. <laughs> um, but it got me thinking, not trying to be irreverent, but it got me to thinking, how fast would the Lord be? One second? Half second? Quarter of a second? Nanosecond? You see, my point is, men measure everything by themselves. The Lord is totally different than that. All wisdom comes from Him. And that's an important question because of Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 25. The Lord asks, by what or to whom do you compare me? I, I measure out the waters with the hollow of my hand. I measure out the heavens by the width of my span. Who, who measures the mountains in scales or the hills in a balance? Who has been the Lord's counselor that He would instruct him? You see the point? Nobody. He is far, far superior to anything that we know. You take Nineveh. Big place. Lots of people. Hey, there had to be real smart people in Nineveh. I mean, you don't grow a city like that without a bunch of smart people. And yet, what did the Lord say about them? The whole city. They don't know their right hand from their left. There's engineers, there's doctors, there's lawyers, but they don't know their right hand from their left. Men have no real understanding. Understanding 
of what? Ah, now we're getting somewhere. Look at the word right or judgment. That's the obligation by which all men are to live in the coming kingdom. When the Lord establishes His rule, it's going to be justice. It's going to be righteousness. That's the standard of everything. Not paragraph 3, page 34. Notice the footnote at the bottom of your page. No, it's all based upon righteousness. The very famous Old Testament word, justice. Point is, the wicked have no idea what it is. They think, oh, if I give a hospital away, the Lord's going to count that as something really important. No. No. Not if you know the revelation of the Word of God. Oh, all you're giving and your hospital wings and airports and whatever you do is of no value. The only thing of value is the Son. The Son of God. He's the wisdom of the world. Now, you see that but? That's the one who... Now here is the word, seeks. Here is the idea of seeking. It is seeking the face of. It's being in front of. We get that from 1 Kings 10.24, and here's how that idea is used. Kings, princes, officials from all over the world came to Jerusalem to be in an audience before the face of Solomon. They wanted to drink in his wisdom. They wanted to experience it. Now, when you and I turn to the pages of the book of Proverbs, and we seek it, it is like being in the presence of Solomon himself. To hear him. To experience him. And here's what happens. Here's the residual for doing that. Proverbs 2.10 Wisdom, skill will enter your heart. It'll be innate. It'll be intuitive. You'll know it. You won't have to cram for it as an exam. You will just know it. It will transform you. That's seeking the Lord. That's seeking His face. And in seeking Him, you will find Him. And what will you find? You will find the pearl of the greatest price. That's who He is. Here's the way Paul put it. I love this. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 8. He said, I count everything as loss compared to the, think of these words, exceeding knowledge. This incredible knowledge. Of Jesus Christ, my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things. He's worth it. He's worth losing your life for. He's worth losing everything for. He is the valuable bar of gold. That's what Paul is saying. Look how it affects you. Look at his last two words. Discern everything. Discern everything. Yeah, everything will come into focus. Your life, your history, where you came from, where you were born, your times, they will all get framed up for you. And it will explain everything because you have set your compass on Him and He is true north for everything. 
Here is here's seven, uh, uh, eight. The one who increases his wealth by interest. It's a proverb regarding the ruthless wealthy who capitalize on the providence of misfortune for the poor and the needy. The means of taking advantage of them is that word interest. In the Old Testament, the term refers to charged or bar, uh, charge or surcharge on borrowed money, just exactly the same as it is in the West for us today. But here are the guidelines. Deuteronomy 23 in the Old Testament. An Israelite could charge interest to a foreigner, but never to one of his fellow Israelites. And this top line presses the point specifically by combining the two terms into one compound phrase of any sort. That's profit or interest. The two terms linked here to the poor. You see that? It's the idea of taking advantage of them. Leveraging oneself. Now you've got to be very careful. Because God created them. That's Proverbs 22 too. The rich and poor have one common element or bond. The Lord's the maker of them both. You see, the poor and the weak we find in the Scriptures, particularly in the Proverbs, are necessary. They're necessary. And that's why we'll always have them with us. Because, see, without them, who are the wise going to take care of? Who are the wise going to minister to? What are you going to do with the rest of your life? So here, here's the wise so that we might display kindness and generosity to them and for them. And that's not only economic. No, no. No, my friends, that's spiritual too. Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, blessed are the poor in spirit. When people don't know the Word of God and you're helping them to understand the Word of God, you are ministering to the poor and the weak. My father walked into this church in the early 70s and he didn't even know enough to carry a Bible. But men here reached out to him. And before long, he had his King James Bible. Teaching him. Speaking to him. That's taking care of the poor and the weak. So, what do we know from the Old Testament? The eyes of the Lord rose to and fro throughout the earth. They look for you. They look for me. And they, He is looking for us who are kind and compassionate for the weak because they're very special to Him. He watches over them. Are you like Him? Line two, providence. Look at your reward. You see that word gathered? Don't run past that word. That's a very important word in the Old Testament. It's used of harvesting. Here's how it was used that is particularly poignant. Genesis 41. The massive harvest of the seven years of plenty down into Egypt. That's the word. It was the prosperity of Joseph's dream. That's the word. Gathered. Gathers in abundance. In the book of Proverbs, it's not only crops, it's money, it's assets. 13.11, gathered by degree. Dishonest money dwindles away, but he who, here's your word, gathers. You gather it little by little and it begins to grow. Before anyone knew the term compounding, interest. You get it from the Bible. So 
Here's the word, and it's a reminder. Here's what it reminds you of. That the Lord can do more for you in one minute, in one hour, in one day, than you could do for yourself in a thousand lifetimes. That's what it's telling you. That's gathering. He can make it happen and He can do it in an instant. So, the proverb is together. That's your reward from the sovereign hand of God. And the Apostle Paul didn't miss it. He didn't miss it at all from the Proverbs. Here's the way he explains it to us. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 6. Remember this. Will you remember this? Remember this, he says. Whoever sows sparingly will gather sparingly. Whoever sows generously will gather generously. So, when I was presenting this to these businessmen back a year and a half ago in Oklahoma City, I asked them this question. How much of the future kingdom do you want? It's all there waiting for you. You have to have a mind to address it. What's holding you back? You know the truth. And here's nine. As for the one who turns aside his ear from hearing instruction, even his prayers are abomination, detestable. What's that all about? Well, the proverb is about reciprocity, meaning mutual exchange. As one commentator put it, if a man on his part is deaf to instruction, then God on his part is deaf to his prayers. Look, we open the top line of the proverb with the familiar word turn. It's a very important verb used in the Old Testament. Let me give you a visual on the word. 1 Samuel 6.12 They put the Ark of the Covenant the, uh, the enemies of Israel put the Ark of the Covenant on a cart. It's supposed to be carried by poles. They put it on a cart. And they took these oxen and they led the cart back to Israel. And the Scriptures say, 1 Samuel 6, 12, that those oxen didn't turn. That's your word. They didn't turn to the right or the left. They kept a straight line going back to Israel. Here, I want you to see, the fool has turned his ear away from hearing. So his mind and his deliberations are shut off or shut down. Paul is in the middle of his testimony in Acts chapter 26 when Festus shouts out to him, Paul, you've gone crazy. You're mad. All your great learning has made you delirious. See, he stopped listening. Now he started thinking on his own rather than absorbing the testimony of this man who had God in his life. Instruction, that's the word Torah. That's the law. It is the light to our path. It's the guide for our way. And now the consequences from the book of consequences. Even, I, I believe everyone has even in their translation. It's an important word because, see, it emphasizes the word prayer. What is prayer? That's communion. Communion with God. How important is that? Well, for 40 days and 40 nights, Moses was on the mountain communing with God and he neither ate nor drank nor slept. That was communion. He was in perfect tranquility before the Lord. And when he came down from the mountain, 
What was the effect? His face shone. What is the effect with you being in the Word of God? You're transformed. You are transformed as a person. Now you're no longer recognizable. Here's the wickedness of the world. Their prayers, well, they're an abomination. Strong word, blatant wickedness. I uh, read from a place I get my news, the Daily Caller. It's a website. September 8th, 2021, one of the fashionable young singers of our day, uh, she exposed her blatant wickedness. Make and watch porn. That's her quote. I stopped the quote at that point. What is she doing? She's abandoning instruction. She's walking away from it. She's abandoning the knowledge of God. Where is she going from that? Total darkness. She's walking away from the skill for living. And soon she will find what everyone finds that lives that way. The decisions that you make, you think you make them? No, they make you. You're the product of your own decisions. And soon she's going to find Proverbs 13, 15, that the way of the transgressor is hard. My friends, God in His grace and mercy has chosen you for a different life. The skill for living, wisdom, here it is. Take it. Drink from the water. Take it. Participate in it. Act upon it. Your light will shine before others. It will give you that energy that the normal man doesn't have. It will give you the internal fortitude, the boldness, the strength for the time that you need it. That's what it promises. It is Christ Jesus in your life who is the wisdom of God for us all. Take this book and pursue it. It's the blessing of the ages. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for our time. Study this morning how grateful we are to be in, around your word, seeking you like they sought the face of Solomon. You are the wisdom. You are the truth. You are the righteous. And we boldly walk in the light as you are in the light because you are life to us created in Christ Jesus. And we will spend eternity with you to love you and to praise you. And I pray that people that hear this word today, both here and in the auditorium, will submit to it, not turn aside, but will find their life in the words of life. And that is the King, the Lord Jesus Himself, in whom we pray. Amen.